Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. Hey, folks, it's Hugh Ballou, another chapter of the Nonprofit Exchange. Russell David Dennis, last week you and I were in Florida. It's a good thing we're not there. Well, yes, <laughs> Wendy, it looks like the storm's turning off and not going as far as inland as they initially thought. So hopefully all of our friends and the wonderful people down at Kaiser that made us feel so welcome are okay. Well, you know, it's called a hurricane, but it's really a slow cane. It's going very slowly through there. So, um... Welcome, folks, to this version of the Nonprofit Exchange. We have a special guest today, Bill Gilmer. He's been uh, on the ride with us ever since we started the magazine, I think over five years ago. So, um, Bill Gilmer, welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. Thanks. Glad to be here. Unlike Russell, I'm in a little bit chillier Blacksburg, Virginia. No hurricane on our horizon, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. We're just up the road in Lynchburg. So, Bill, um, we ask our guests to say a little bit about themselves. Just what's your background and why is it you're doing this important work that you're doing now? My background, I used to be a, used to be a printer, I used to run a printing company. And um, over the years, we discovered that most of the work we were doing was for nonprofits. And over the years, we started tracking response rates on donor relation campaigns. And so we've put together a system of marketing to donors, of maintaining donors, and that's what we do every day, help folks build their relationships with their donor base. And you've been working with Center Vision since, oh, we started this magazine thing five, six years ago. And yes. Very first, and um, let's just declare up front, uh, Word Sprint, Bill's company is a sponsor for um, nonprofit performance magazine, but of Center Vision's work in general. We talk about you often on these podcasts, so it's a pleasure to have you here live and in person. Um, this is not an infomercial for WordSprint, but we uh, know about the value of the work. So we, we talk about the 30, 30, 30, 10, um, our short message for you. That's the secret for success. Now, just to be clear, people could do this on their own. They don't need you, but if they want to do it the, the very best way possible, you know how to do that. So explain to us what this 3030 is all about. What we discovered, and this is lots of data. We started tracking this back in the early 2000s. And uh, I think we were up to about 20 million touches, uh, 15,000 some campaigns. What we discovered is that there are three things that matter. We call it our three-bit marketing system but there are three things that matter when it comes to donor relations. The first is having the right message. The second is getting that right message to the right people. And the third, getting the right message to the right people with the right rhythm. And so we help clients focus their message, stay consistent with their message, stay on message, we help them with the right people by working with database cleansing, database acquisition, all kinds of demographics and predictive analytics. But most importantly, we've developed a system for staying consistent and rhythmic with your donor touches. And we've observed through all our data, that's where many nonprofits fail, it's the rhythm and consistency. So the right message to the right people with the right rhythm. That's the 30, 30, 30. What do you say to people that say, you know, I tried mailing, it just didn't work. I tried sending out a mailing in the year and we got, we got a little bit of money, but it just didn't work, Bill. Well, I tell them that I tried dieting once last year and it didn't work either. Well, I tried working out once, it didn't work either. <laughs> I tried to exercise once and it didn't work. No, it really is like diet or exercise or physical therapy. These are things that work if you implement them rhythmically. It's not a quick fix. It's not something that you can, you know, rhythm doesn't become rhythm right away. It needs a few cycles. In fact, on average, for most of our clients, it 
it's really in the third year, the third year of repeated rhythmic touches that the donations start to snowball, that, uh, that it really begins to build. So this is, not a, uh, this is not a show horse thing. This is a plow horse. This is a, a drip marketing, if you will. But it works. It works. And I've seen it work. And I think I'm muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I, so dig a little bit deeper into this, um, you know, the right person, the right message. Dig a little bit deeper into those channels because it okay. sounds well, interesting. I want to know more on how I can do this. Well, the right message, the first, the, the first pillar, the, the right message is really your brand. It's who you are. It's why you go to work every day. Uh, it, it's your mission. It's your elevator speech. What we found is that nonprofits that stay on message, that stay true to themselves about who they are, are the ones that are more successful over time, as opposed to those that try to be all things to all people or try to repackage it or try to rebrand every year. I'm not saying you can't rebrand, but you need to do so very carefully. So the right message is mainly a matter of consistency and articulating it clearly, having the right taglines, having the right logo, have that right the key messaging, the key paragraphs. The right people, the right message to the right people, the right people gets a little more complicated. It is all about relationships. We find that the nonprofits who succeed are those who create a database culture where they take those relationships and get them into the database, that everyone in the organization is empowered to update the database. I mean, your best donors are the people you know. People donate to people. People donate to you because they trust you to fulfill your mission. So it's the people you know, it's the people you run into, the people that come to your open house. These are the best potential donors. And we found that the organizations that know how to capture that and bring it into their database so that these people get rhythmic touches, rhythmic notifications are the ones that succeed. Now you can also acquire data. I mean, we do a lot of this. We're uh, using some pretty fancy predictive analytics. We can actually acquire names of people that are more likely to donate to your cause than others. But that's kind of almost a whole topic in and of itself. Well, so talk a little bit about that. We, um, we constantly, Russ and I run across people that say, I don't know anybody. So if we're if we, we do have people that are in nonprofits that maybe they get donations but they don't really have a donor management program per se, or they work with a number of early states they're starting up and they I don't know a whole lot of people. So talk a little bit about how do you acquire names uh, legally, and then <laughs> is there a magic database program that's gonna gonna help you connect with them? It's all legal. <laughs> um, there are about seven, six or seven big players in this game. They're called compilers. Uh, these are companies who do nothing but purchase, massage, and resell databases. You've heard of some of them. Uh, Dun & Bradstreet does this mostly with businesses. Uh, Experian, Equifax, the one that had the big data breach. Uh, Info USA, uh, there are several others. And then there are literally thousands of uh, brokers and people that take the information from these larger players and resell it to folks like us and you. Demographics are available. We as a society click a lot. We are on our computers and we're clicking. We go to Amazon, we read the paragraph, we look at another book, we order this, we fill out a warranty card. We subscribe to a magazine. We join a club. We do all of these things, and all of those are data transactions that are public, that can be sold and resold. Uh, of course, the hard demographics are always been there. The things like the value of your home, the kind of car you drive, that's all public information. But these compilers gather so many data points on all of us as consumers that they are able, with artificial intelligence help, they, they see patterns and they build logarithms 
And so they know that if you've done this and this and this and this, then you are more likely to support a nonprofit that focuses on children and especially disabled children. That's how detailed it can get. Or you're more likely to support a local nonprofit that uh, works in the music arts, like an orchestra or a, a symphony. Um, you can drill down to all, we, we call these predictive analytics. This is data that indicates the likelihood of someone supporting your cause. This has gotten way better than it was even six months ago. What we usually do, and Hugh, you've had some recent experience with this, with uh, one of your organizations. When we do a database acquisition like this, we then compare it to the organization's existing donor database. And if the predictive analytics have been accurate, they will, there will be considerable overlap. And so when we, I think you know, your organization had like uh, 3,000 names and we bought another 700, 800, and we would normally, you know, three years ago, you expect like 10 or 12 of those to be an overlap. I think we had a 250 name overlap in that case. Those analytics were extremely accurate. So these are folks that not just demographically speaking, but in terms of propensity are more likely to support your cause. Now you still have to touch them and you have to touch them rhythmically. And so that's where the whole rhythm thing comes in and that's where you need to get establish a cycle of consistent, of consistent cadence of touches. And over the course of several cycles, usually end of the second, beginning of the third year, that's when you'll start seeing some donations come in and it will snowball over time. So when you're talking about clicking, um, we're talking about mail in the US mail. We're not talking about email with our computer. I don't think I quite catch the last part of your question, but in terms of what we advise for donor relations, it's a combination of mailing and emailing. Oh, yeah, it's all systematic. It, it's very systematic the approach to keeping and maintaining donors. And a lot of, especially small nonprofits, are going to be overwhelmed when they start thinking about all this data and maybe even uh, a little confused as to what a touch point is. Because, well, you know, like lots of folks like me, I get lots of mail, I get lots of email from a lot of the same uh, folks. And, and so, Maybe they think, oh, I, I don't want to be this person that's bombarding somebody with six emails a day. But, but when you talk in terms of touches, there are specific things that you're accomplishing with, with each touch. So can you talk to the viewers a little bit about just like, let's take, say, a generic year or a generic quarter and what some of those touch points are and the method to the madness behind them? Yeah. Let me give you a kind of a common example, a mid-sized nonprofit, a local nonprofit, let's say they've got you know, five or six staff, something like that, maybe 10 or 12. I would say on average, our clients would have several touches. They would probably have one event, one event every year. Say in the spring, they're going to do a, uh, a luncheon where they talk about their cause and they invite people to come and they ask for money while they're there. So they have one event. They might have a monthly blog. One month, the first Monday of every month, they put out something on social media. They might have a fall appeal mailing. This is where they actually write a letter. Dear Dr. Smith, here's the great stuff we do. Please give us money. If they're smart, they'll have that appeal mailing coupled with an auto-triggered email where the day after Dr. Smith gets the letter, he gets an automatic email that says, hey, Dr. Smith, did you get our letter yesterday? About, I bet you trashed it, didn't you? But don't worry, <laughs> you can still just click here to support our cause. Uh, and then maybe once in the winter and once in the summer, they'll do an e-newsletter. So what they're doing, they're sending out information two or three times a year, information only. They're asking for money in a hard ass twice a year, and the example I gave once with a mailer, an email, and once with an event. It would be something like that. Now we have some clients that 
do mailers and ask for money every month. We have others that do it once a year with a hard mailing. Um, what we don't have is much success with straight email solicitation. People do like the convenience of donating online, but they don't trust it unless it has something based in the physical world, whether that's a letter that they got and threw away, then they get the email, they'll trust it a lot more because they got that mail piece. Yeah. They've been to an open house and then they get the email, they'll trust that because they associate it with the real life physical experience they had. So that would be typical, you know, a hard ask twice a year, two or three information only, and maybe something monthly on social media. What we find does not work is the single big blast. So many people want to put all their eggs into one basket. We're going to have this big, huge shindig, and we're going to send out 200,000 invitations, and, and it doesn't do that well. It is better to touch 200 people rhythmically than 200,000 in a blast. Is that well, the key? The, the, the key is to spread these over with the combination of ask, non ask, yes, relationships, maybe giving them information about some of the programs that they were talking about in the newsletter, how the dollars are impacting, how many yes. people were served, and what the big shift is. And, and uh, yes, in, in, impact is huge. Uh, so, if, if oh, I'm sorry. If, if we're talking about nailing, say, contacting 200 people at a time, does this mean, this probably means for a medium sized uh, nonprofit that they're sending stuff out weekly to different donors? Most that? of our clients, you know, an average database for our clients would probably be in the range of two to 10,000 donors. We often do mailings okay. of 3,000. Sometimes we do a hundred thousand, but you know, I would say on average, let's say five thousand. Do most of our clients would do one or two mailings a year? Appeal, spring appeal. Sometimes in lieu of a spring appeal, they'll do that spring event. And so that's the hard ask. The other touches, the monthly social media, and then the e-newsletter in the quarters when they're not hard asking to send out information only. That would be a very balanced mix. Here's what you want to avoid. <clears throat> Let me get to another key point. This is kind of the magic right here. Rhythm is really important. Understanding the rhythm that your clients respond to. And most of you know this, most nonprofit organizations have a pretty good understanding of how often their donors and potential donors want to be asked once a year, twice a year, once a month sometimes. But the organization usually knows what the rhythm should be. Rhythm is so important that, and it's so important that you sustain it over the years, that our biggest piece of advice is adjust the scale to match your budget so that you can sustain the rhythm. So we actually help clients with spreadsheets where it shows, let's say I want to mail to 20,000 people twice a year. Well, you start looking at that and the postage alone exceeds your budget. You just, you can't do that. And so they want to do it. Well, let's try it one time. No, don't do that. <laughs> what you do, you adjust that scale. If you can't afford the postage of 20,000 appeal letters, then can you do 10,000? No, 5,000. You, you play with that number, with that spreadsheet, and you finally settle on, you know, we can sustain 2,500 twice a year. That's the amount you go with. Well, how do you target? You have this pool of 10, 10 or 20,000. How do you target down to the 2,500? That's where you do the predictive analytics. You mail only to those 2,500 that are most likely to donate to your cause. It's a budget thing. You adjust your scale to match your budget so that you can sustain that rhythm. Because if you sustain the rhythm through several cycles, two or three years, it works. This is based on data of what actually works, not what makes you feel good or look good, but did the donations come rolling in? Yeah. So what, 
what's the what's the best path to help a, 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 a new organization or a new client when they come to you and they uh, they may have some stuff they kept on Excel or somewhere, but they don't necessarily have a donor database or a CRM uh, because they they looked at these things and, and uh, thought they were hard to use or and they know that they need to get better information. So uh, talk a little bit about that process where you help them uh, uh, um, look at the most important factors and how to organize that data and how you guide them to build that so that they actually get effective data from what they're collecting. We know there are lots of databases out there, <laughs> as you know, and we deal with lots of them and people are constantly asking us which one's the best all i can honestly say is the best one is the one that someone in your organization is willing to dive into because with the right operator any of these databases can sing they really can i mean some of our biggest clients use salesforce for their nonprofit <laughs> data um there's a whole spectrum so it's not so much which crm system you use it's do you have someone and, and a backup or two that really knows how to use it. If you have no money, you can't do anything. You can't, you don't have somebody use Excel. <laughs> it's not so much what you use as how you use it. We can assist. We understand a lot of these databases. Uh, we love working with Excel in terms of immediate back and forth with our clients. They'll, uh, you know, export their database to a CSV or an Excel file and we'll, all the updated dressing is, you know, we run it through the deceased person's filter, do all those fancy things, make sure that list is scrubbed and clean. But we do all that from Excel. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, it's a really robust program, definitely, it is. Microsoft Excel. I think what trips people up more than anything else is understanding, you know, what are the most important pieces for me to collect? And then once I collect all of these, what's the best way to sort of categorize or, or shift my people around or, or look at, uh, now that I've got it, how do I use it? <laughs> we know this kind of leads into something new that we're doing. I say new within the last couple of years. Um, let's say you, you inherit a nonprofit. You come in as the new executive director and there's been some staff turnover and you have three or four of these huge Excel files with all this data, and you don't really know your donors. You, can, you have some record of who gave when, but you don't know why the other people are in there. Are they good prospects? That type of thing. We can actually take that database, those Excel files, do all the usual stuff, combine, dedupe, update the addresses, make sure they're not deceased. Then we do something called data append. And this we send that file, let's say you've got 3,000 names in there, you only know 50 of them, you don't know who the other 2,950 are. We can send it confidentially to some of these national compilers. They can run it versus their data banks and back with demographic data filled in where you can age, the education level, the value of the home, the household income, the the gender, the political persuasion, all sorts of things you can add back into that list. And that can be target. You can kind of say, listen, this, you know, these 300 people just don't match the profile of our donors. I, I don't see why we're mailing to them. They haven't given to us in five years. Let's drop them. But these 400 look really good. They match the profile. They're uh, active in the community. They look like they should. So we're going to keep them on our list. So that's, that's what you do there. You can actually, uh, we call it scoring data or uh, modeling data. So there's all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. So there's so many nuances to relating to donors. They, they come from different backgrounds, different education levels, different parts of the country, uh, they're in different age groups. And um, so when, when people look at this and they say, well, I've kind of got a, a lot of different people What's the, what's the best way for me to, to organize these groups and what are there touch points that are more effective for some groups than others and how do we go yeah. about looking at that? Yeah. 
Yes. One thing I haven't talked about yet a lot is what channel do you use? Mm. Is this a graphic that's going to respond to a Facebook post or is this a demographic that's going to respond to a physical newsletter or an e-newsletter or an email? Um, you know, you, you can ask them. <laughs> that's a good thing to do is kindly ask them, how would you prefer to receive this? Just make some age and generation assumptions. You know, millennials actually like direct mail more than, than you think. Some older folks don't like it as much as you think. <laughs> the one thing we do advise people to do is do what we call a scatter graph. A scatter graph is where you just sitting around the table brainstorm and you make a graph of your best donors in terms of their age, their income level or a value of home, their education level, uh, maybe some with geography. And as you start graphing this, you will have people all over that graph. You will have some young kids that donate to your cause. You have some great grandfathers who donate to your cause. You have some uneducated, some educated, but there will be, if the more you plot those little dots on your graph, you will see a cluster in the middle and that's your sweet spot. If you want to go after and acquire, you acquire more donors that match those demographics. Then you add those predictive analytics. But it's always good to have a profile of who is our sweet spot donor. Does that help any? Okay. That's, that's very helpful, yes, in terms of looking at that. Uh, when you start working with, a, with an organization, uh, how can, uh, what, what type of organization are, are you most effective at helping? What, what are some of the things that the organization can do that will help you get them results a little faster? Well, you know, that's a great, great question, Russell. We find that most nonprofits are pretty good at the first 30%, the message nonprofits know darn well why they do what they do. It's their passion. It's why they go to work. They usually got that part pretty nailed down. <laughs> you know, they got that elevator speech. Like you can't show up right now. <laughs> but anyway, they got the message. We find that we can help a lot with the rhythm. Mm. We can build these Excel sheets. We can send them reminder notifications like, hey, remember your, your blog is due day after tomorrow or, you know, your your e-newsletter should launch next week. We send them these reminders that keep them on track. Kind of like a Fitbit reminds you to hop up and walk around. We do yeah. the thing. We do these notifications that keep you on track. The one that's the hardest is the data because Ooh. it's relationships. And we don't know the people in their database, but they do. They know more of them than, than not say the thing an organization could do to get the best results is to go through their database with as many constituents involved as possible. Your volunteers, your staff, your, your key donors, break it up into small bits and do a little bit at a time, but get through that database and try to understand who your donors are. Um, that would probably be the best. Leverage your board. Who every board member should have a gun to their head that says, who do you know that might donate to our cause? <laughs> Give us their names. Um, leverage conversations. Your whole staff should be encouraged. I mean, you know, you've got a new uh, administrative assistant who's helping you with this. And she bumps into somebody at the grocery store that says, hey, Sally, I haven't seen you in a long time. What are you doing? Well, you know, I'm working at Habitat for Humanity now, and we're doing this and this. And that person says, wow, that sounds really interesting. Tell us a little bit more. Sally needs to know to come back and get that information in the database. That person that she just bumped into in the grocery store is a better prospect than any of these purchase names that we're talking about. So does everyone in the organization from the board to the staff to the volunteers realize it is their personal relationships that lead to the best database? Uh, it's a warm market and warm referrals are really good, you know. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that, that I've seen information on and talked to people about is in having people on your team, you, you 
you want to have good tools for them to use to actually go out and talk about your organization. So talk, if you can take a few minutes, talk about some of the tools, uh, you know, printed tools that, that toolkits that you give the, that you make for board members and volunteers and different people uh, with, with information on the organization, how they organize that and, and the tools that they have to talk, uh, talk about their organization in the best way. Funny you should ask. <laughs> We just worked up some uh, little handout cards, as old fashioned as that sounds, a little bit bigger than a business card. And the organization calls them the get involved cards. Okay. But it basically on one size has the logo and a very uh, truncated poignant abbreviation of the mission. And then on the back side, it has three ways to get involved. You can go to this website and do this. You can become a volunteer and do this. You can call this number and do this. And they give these cards to everyone on staff. They give it to all their volunteers and just encourage them that when you're in the grocery store and that your old roommate comes up to talk to you, you give them one of the cards. Something as simple as that. It it's, is. It's important to, important to have those little pieces. Are you, is there a way that you have people who have these tools? Uh, uh, do you have a simple system for them to sort of keep track of how many people are coming? Uh, how do you help help them document the effectiveness of these tools? You know, we haven't done a lot of that. Um, the organizations themselves usually keep a database of, you know, how many cards did you hand out and, you know, can you talk about it? Ideally, you're getting some name, address, city, state, zip, phone number, email into your database from that encounter. And that's the ideal is when you bump into the old roommate in the grocery store that you say, hey, do you have a business card? Uh, can, you, can you text me something so I can keep in touch with you? I'd like to send you some information about XYZ charity that I So yeah, the ones that I know that do this on a regular basis have weekly staff meetings and they go over contacts. It's the most important thing. It really, you think about it. It's, you're an ambassador. You're an ambassador for Habitat for YMCA for the foundation for whatever it is your nonprofit is. It's those contacts and that's people give to people. I, I know you think they give to your organization because you do all this good. They give because they know and trust you to carry out that mission. It's all about trust. It's all about trust. Well, it's it, underlying that's the relationship building, Bill. And um, I can't tell you how many nonprofits, of course, I'm sure you know, how many nonprofits out there get a check and then they wait till next year to ask for another check. And I don't know what the average is, Russell, you might know that, that what, 70% of most nonprofits, the bulk of their money from donors? Is it? There's a large percentage, anyway. Yeah, we really do need to take care of our donors better. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> we recommend the pyramid where you take your database and you have your top donors at the top. And at some point you draw that line where everyone above this level of giving gets the personal visit from the executive director or gets the personal phone call or gets the, you know, three phone calls a year, whatever that appropriate nurturing touch is. And then maybe the ones at the bottom just get a thank you card. But the top people, your key donors, need to be acknowledged, they need to be thanked, they need, they need, they need the recognition. You can't do that with all 3,000 names, but you can do it with the top 50. Mm -hmm. So we recommend that triangle approach, pyramid approach. Well, that, you know, it's the old um, Pareto principle, you know, the 80-20 rule, probably 80% of your money comes from 20% of your people. And yes. Uh, the leader is challenged to be able to spend enough time with too many people. So my, my rule of thumb is just kind of what you said. You want to spend individual time with that 20%, but you want to stay in touch with the 80% and the mailing program is a good way for them to do that. Right. And, you know, we, we slice and dice it even further. Um, give you an example. I'll give the example of, uh, they won't mind me talking about them. Um, well, I'll just say it's a local uh, arts nonprofit that does 
theater and plays and stuff. Mm -hmm. They have a huge donor database. The ones at the very top get the personal visit, they get the handwritten note, they get the creme de la creme. Then the next hunk of several thousand records gets variable data printed communication. When I say variable data, it has a salutation, dear Sam and Jackie, uh, this communication, let's say it's a letter or postcard, whatever, flips out pictures of the last show they went to. Uh, it's highly personalized because they have scrubbed the data that far down that they trust it. They know that's accurate. Variable data personalization works as long as it's very accurate. And then the bottom part of the pyramid gets the dear friend of XYZ Theater. The very bottom of it is not personalized because they simply don't have the resources to scrub their data all the way down and make sure the salutations are correct and the other variable data information is accurate. So this is important as far as, as managing your budget. You know, you're, yes. you're, you're getting the most bang for the buck and where a lot of people don't think they have money to spend, they may find that after going through and, and working with someone like you, they may be able to find places where they can actually spend the same dollars but get more bang for the buck. And so uh, uh, when, you're, when you're working with an organization, sometimes, they have board members or volunteers of different people uh, participating in the process. So, so how important is, is training for all of these key people and, and, and what are some of the most important things for you to cover when you're, when you're training them? Let me do just a little tangent because something you said reminded me of something. This is back in the early 2000s, 2005, 2007, right in there. We had not yet developed our full-blown three-bit marketing system, but we were beginning to gather the data and we were beginning to understand that the rhythmic touching was what's important. Well, I ended up being the chair of a uh, very small nonprofit. It was a little uh, private school trying to get off the ground in the middle of nowhere, Southwest Virginia. And we didn't have the money to hire my company. <laughs> we were struggling, man. And we had about 300 names of donors and potential donors. Well, we had 10 board members. 300 names, 10 board members. What a coincidence. Here we did. We wrote the letter. A couple of us got together and wrote a really good letter. And we took it to the board meeting. And we said, OK. Sam, you're on the board, you're responsible for these 30 potential people. You make copies of the letter, sneak them at your church, <laughs> at the office, make your copies somehow, you pay for the postage, that's why you're on the board. And we assigned each board member 30 records from that database. So as an organization, we didn't spend any money. We leveraged our board and they each had to make a few copies and come up with 30 first class stamps, but we did it rhythmically. And we did that appeal mail in that time three times a year. And by the third year, what do you know? Then we could afford to have somebody else do all this. <laughs> so yeah, but that was definitely training board members to actually get out in the trenches. I mean, Hugh talks about this all the time, but you, the importance of an energized and dedicated board is, I mean, I, I can't say enough about it. That is just so critical to having a thriving nonprofit. That it is, you know, it's all about the people you have, the people that support mm -hmm. you, the people in the organization. Yeah. Your, your team is your secret sauce. And so that's yeah. where you grow and, and prosper and, and create more impact in the lives of others. And, and you know, knowing how to reach out to them and what, uh, what really resonates with them is very important. So. Uh, having that system and having the tools to, to get them there, you know. But yeah, the one thing we haven't really touched on is that that with donors, you really kind of got three phases. You, you're acquiring them. And then at some point, as they're sticking with you, you want them to stick with you. You want them to grow. You want them to grow those donors and you want them to stay. So there's sort of three pieces to that. Um, uh, talk a little bit, of, if you if you would, about 
uh, some of the best ways to to uh, move them through that process. How do you yeah. how do you acquire them? What are some some key tips for that? Uh, how do what are some things that will help you grow them? One or two things, and then what are some of the most important things to keep them uh, uh, sticking right. with you? Well, the acquisition part we talked about a little bit. You know, the best way is those personal relationships, those personal contacts. Uh, a second best way would be doing some data acquisition. And you can do the acquisition yourself. You don't have to go through a company like mine. You can just Google it, how to acquire donors, and there'll be plenty of places that crop up that'll sell names, everything. So that's the acquisition part. The rhythm means a lot here. The rhythmic touch is how you keep them and how you make them poised to, to grow. Uh, you know, usually it's in the second or third year that you get the first donation from a brand new contact. And to do that, you need to do those rhythmic touches. Like I said, this is not an overnight success thing. This is the this is long haul. I will also say that it is rare, not unheard of, but it's rare for someone to move from a $50 per cycle donor level to a 5,000 without something happening. And that's something, they come to your event, they hear the speaker, they get a visit from a board member, they get a visit from the executive director, something to, to get that kind of nurturing increase. It, it, it's, uh, it takes something. It, it's rare that someone will just jump from 50 to $500 or $5,000, just repeated asks that are, that are passive like that. I think one of the best is the, uh, I mean, it doesn't fit every nonprofit, but it fits a lot, is to have that annual luncheon where, you, you know, the board members are assigned to uh, fill tables. <laughs> and when they invite people, they let them know, listen, uh, we're going to do a presentation and you're, you're going to be asked to give some money. You don't have to, but just to let you know there will be an ask, but really love to have you. And you get people in that room and you have dynamic speakers. You have a some of the people that you serve, you, you, you have, uh, it depends on what kind of nonprofit you have, but you do things that let people have a real glimpse into how you make the world a better place. That has been known to move people from the $50 level to the 500 or the 5,000. So. It, yeah, well, well yeah. executed non-ask events are, are critical too. Yes. Just to let people know, hey, here's what we do. We're being good stewards of your money. Yeah. And, you know, there's something magic, I think, about walking them around your thing where they can see where it is that people are actually out there in the trenches doing good work and, uh, and just speaking to some of the things you're able to acquire and how you can move things, uh, move these services out into the community so they get a working understanding. And that, that whole growth piece, I mean, getting them in, 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 in growing them, that growth piece is, I guess that's the, your lifetime value of a customer, if you, yeah. if, for want of a better way to put it, but that, that takes time. But to grow them, you've got to keep them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what, are, what, well, what would you say the two, well, one or two most important things? There are some simple things you can do. Obviously, you need to thank them for their gifts. Mm -hmm. It can be, you know, again, the pyramid, the ones mm -hmm. that should probably get a personal visit, personal phone call. The ones at the bottom, maybe it's a handwritten thank you note, but something has to happen. More and more of our clients are doing the uh, board uh, pizza party where they get their board together and some phones right around dinner time and they serve the board pizza and they telephone the donors, the top donors. Now, it, they do it around dinner time, so a lot of people don't answer the phone, but that's fine. You leave a message. And the board member says, hey, Dr. Smith, just want to really thank you and your wife for your $500 gift to our organization. We really appreciate it. It helps us do this, this, and this. And, you know, that donor will remember that. That donor will hey, wow, they actually, you know, a board member called me. So that's a nice little thing to do and to touch the top donors that way. I mean, the ones at the really top, the, the big players probably need the personal thank you from the... <laughs> the chair of the board and the executive director. But you can hit a lot of those mid-donors mid with a phone call from a board member. It means a lot. I mean, th think about the 
donations you make, how often do you get a phone call of thanks? Not, not that many. Not many. <laughs> Maybe I'm not donating enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, it, it's always it's always good. You know, and that's uh, you know, it, it's just common courtesy. You know, if you're in a supermarket or somewhere, someone holds the door. They, just just saying thank you to people is a reflex, but somehow it seems like from some of the statistics I've seen that it's one of the more common mistakes that people make. They don't they don't, they don't take think. that time to yeah. say thank you. Uh, what are a couple of other really common mistakes that people make that are just quick and easy to fix? Well, um, accurate data is really big. If you say dear Sam and the name's Sam, that's not good. Um, you, you've got to be very careful with, we call it variable data, but very careful with personalization. Personalization gone awry does more damage than it does to good. Um, one thing we've been doing more and more, the post office has gotten a lot better with their deceased persons filter. So you try to cut out, say, dear John and Sally when John passed away a year ago. That's, you know, that's an easy mistake to fix. Just run the data through a filter. Don't, don't mail to dead people at all possible. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so, so data cleanliness is, is a common thing. Not thanking is probably a, the biggest thing. Um, and you mentioned something earlier. Every touch can't be an ask. Really should be there should be more information only touches than there are ask touches. So, you know, there should be, a, you know, the top donors should probably get some little report at the end of the year, a few months after, maybe not a big fancy report, but even just a sheet of, here's what your donation allowed us to do. You can do these cool little infographic looks and, you know, you can really show people what you've done. There should be touches like, a, we have a client now that has this really neat system. They do, three newsletters a year and it's an uh, they have an elder elderly donor base so these are physical newsletters but because newsletters are more expensive they've gone to a news postcard they send out this jumbo postcard three times a year little short bullet point articles that show their impact every one of those little short articles it's really just bullet points and headlines because people don't read it anymore it's got a link to a website you can go to if you want more information. But they do this three times a year. And then in the fourth quarter, they ask. So they push out information on a three to one ratio with their ask. So we recommend something like that, two to one, three to one, something like that. So that people don't think, good grief, XYZ charity is always asking for money. It's got to be, here's the good stuff we're doing. Your social media should be that. Your social media, personally, I don't think should ask for money. I think social media should be, look at what we're doing. Celebrate with us. Well, it'll certainly be a place to capture some of your, your benefactors, the clients yeah. online to talk about what's yeah. going on. Some of the sites that the work is being done on, it's almost like a news medium or something yeah. there. And it's just like, and even mentioning when somebody hears their name mentioned on social media, if you got a thousand followers, <laughs> that likes it, you know, they're, whoa, they, they're talking about me. This thing's got a thousand views right. and got 10,000 followers. Hey, maybe I need to send them another check. <laughs> they, they need to get my good side next time. <laughs> Well, that's part. It's that's part good. of the story. I think you're telling telling a story. You're, you got relationships, and yeah, there are people who want to be in the in the picture with a big check, and and um, there's all types of people. I don't think you think about the amount of stories we need to tell it because we're doing a lot of good work, and we don't really tell people. And actually, social media is in fact social. We're supposed to engage, and we I see all too often. Hammer, give us money, give us money, buy this, do that, and there's no attempt at a relationship. And I think that's that's what I'm hearing you say. In our program, we're building relationships. And we're maintaining relationships and people give the people. That's the biggest story. I, I mean that's the biggest soundbite that I 
people, not to organize. I agree. The it is all about relationships, and you mentioned it's all about telling your story. That's what relationships are. We as humans are people who have relationships with each other, and we tell stories to each other. I mean, it's whether you come home to your spouse and say, "Honey, you won't believe what happened to me in the you know chat line today." We love to tell stories, and I think social media is great for this, where you can just have these little snippets and tell this little vignette story of something your nonprofit did or something that you did, um, but it's to build relationships. The best, I keep coming back to this, the best donor is the one that knows you, has come to you, that you have that personal relationship with. But you do it by stories. You know, we recommend that the hard ask appeal letter that everybody does in the fall, a lot of people do in the fall, we recommend that it start off with just a three to four sentence, five sentence story that is in a nutshell what you do. And then you make your ask. Then, then you take it to the next level. There are so many kids like little Johnny and then you make your ask. But in your first paragraph, you tell Johnny's story in just a sense. Stories mean a lot. So you, you have really, really critical points in the year. A lot happens toward the end of the year around Giving Tuesday and the back end of the year. Uh, are there some time periods during the course of, uh, of a year that you believe uh, nonprofits are sort of leaving money on the table? Maybe, you know, are, are there some times to reach out that, that might be a lot more effective than people pay attention to? You know, that's another great question. <laughs> it's changing. Uh, it used to be I would always tell people to do their main appeal early to mid-November because we were told, we learned, this, the, the stats said that the most generous week of the year is the week leading up to Thanksgiving because everybody's starting to feel festive, but they don't have any worries about the credit card bills yet. Um, but, and you know, I, I, we've also heard that summer is not a great time to ask because so many people on vacation, they're gonna miss the appeal and that type of thing. I tell you though, people are so connected now. And of course, with you know tax law changes, the end of the year may not be as significant a time as it has been. We are finding more and more of our clients are doing odd, oddly timed appeals. Now it's just starting, so they haven't really built a rhythm yet. But we have clients that are doing a you know a February appeal. We have clients July appeal. <laughs> so. <laughs> Stay tuned. I'll have a better answer in three years. <laughs> we get some data back on that. Yeah. But I really, I really think that if you talk with your key constituents, talk to your board, talk to your staff, talk to maybe a few of your key donors, you'll know. You'll know when the appropriate time is to do your ask and to do your information only. Remember the point about you adjust the scale to fit the budget so that you can sustain the rhythm. Mm -hmm. One thing I meant to mention is, it's not just the financial budget, it's the budget of your time. Here is another common mistake. We see it probably most often with social media. You get all excited, you say, I'm gonna write a blog every week, and I'm gonna post it out on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, well, you know, I don't know many executive directors who have the time to write a blog every week. Now, if you do more power to you, but our suggestion would be, are you really, let's be realistic about this, adjust the scale to match the time budget. How much time do you have so that you can sustain the rhythm? So we would counsel you down from once a week to maybe the first Monday of every month. So if that's too much, time. if you can't stick with that, then the, you know, the first day of each quarter. So it's the regular rhythm that we heard about earlier, too. Speaking of time, we're, we've just frittered away an hour. So we're coming up on the top of the hour. Um, we're going to do a sponsor message. And, uh, and Bill, you get the last word. Give people a uh, thought or a tip or a challenge to think of. As, as you, This has been a very helpful interview. 
as much. Our sponsor is ourselves. The Center Vision Leadership Foundation has an online community for community builders. And one of the things we do is we do live events around the country. We're talking to you in September, and we have another event in Florida coming up. So if, uh, if you want to know about that, pull out your text, your, your cell phone. I want you to text. We're going to get a live card that you can register for this event and sign up for the community. So if you text the number two, no, no, sorry, the number is 64600. That in the number, 64600, and text the letters, capital L, capital E, capital S, L-E-S. That's the Leadership Empowerment Symposium. Happen very shortly, and we do these monthly, so the time you go to texting 64600 and you put in L-E-S, you're gonna get the current live event. Sign up for the community, you can see the magazine, it's printed by Warren Sprint. You can get on the list and mail to you. So our our and our other sponsor, one of our other sponsors, card is the one that buys this card. If you're tired of giving out business cards and people use them, give them your easy card. And that connects them to your website. We'd love to get you in there and, and be in conversation with great people like Bill Gilmer and five years worth of these interviews are in there as well as worth as well as five years of the Profit Performance 360 magazine uh, printed by WordSprint. So if you want to go to wordsprint.com, you can schedule an uh, interview with Bill if you want to get a quote on his services. You want to talk about uh, how it looks for you to build out your list and to stay in touch with your tribe. Because I got to tell you, the regular mailing to your tribe makes a difference. Bill, um, WordSprint.com is one of our main sponsors. Thank you for that. And we talk about you often, but talk about what people need to do now. If they're leaving this interview, what's your challenge or your, your parting thought for people? My parting thought would be that it really is all about relationships. And the piece of the puzzle that you as a director or a board member or staff can do to help your organization the most is to work on those relationships and on getting that relationship into a database so that they can get rhythmic touches. If anybody would like to chat with me about this, we do free consultations, no cost, no obligation at wordsprint.com. You can send me a message. I'll be happy to talk in detail about your organization and things that we think might work for you. Our system of getting the right message to the right people with the right rhythm does not mean you have to use us. You can use uh, current partners, you can do it in-house yourself. It's the system that works. The right message to the right people with the right rhythm. Bill, thanks again for joining us. And thanks for all the support that you give us here at Center Vision Leadership. You certainly make us look good. So folks, uh, do yourself a favor, have a talk with Bill and his team about how you can bring donors in, grow them, keep them, and, uh, and build those relationships using the right tools by getting out there, sending the right message to the right people in the right rhythm. And it needs to look good, but that's only 10%. So, and it will. You make sure that you, you check out the Nonprofit Performance 360 magazine because it's a really good looking magazine. When you come to the Cinevision Leadership website, there's a big blue button on the right corner that says join. Join the community. You'll find all sorts of wonderful tools, resources, rebroadcasts of this podcast. You'll see episodes here uh, where you can watch them. Then you can go to iTunes or Stitcher and subscribe to the Nonprofit Exchange so that you can have all of this information on the go and listen to it anywhere, anytime. We are here every Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern with brilliant people like Bill here on the Nonprofit Exchange to help you ramp up your organization and grow the impact that you're making out there, making the difference of lives in the lives of other people that you serve. So until next time, thank you for all that you do. Keep on keeping on. Uh, connect with us, join us, uh, and we'd be happy to walk with you as you go on this journey to make a difference in your community. 
Until next week, this is Russell Dennis and Hugh Ballou signing off, and we will see you next Tuesday on the Nonprofit Exchange. Thank <laughs> you.